Hello again, my friends. This is Kanita, and I greet you warmly in the name of our risen Lord, Yeshua, Almighty God, and I welcome you back to the podcast. You know, my friends, salvation, salvation itself, is the grand symphony of Almighty God, conducted in three movements. Salvation past, salvation present, and salvation future. Salvation past consists in having our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. Salvation present consists in the manifestation of Christ into our souls through the work of the Holy Spirit, wherein we are made, we are betrothed unto Him. Salvation future consists in the internal and eternal enjoyment of Christ when the elect shall sit down to the marriage supper of the Lamb and shall forever be with the Lord. Now as none will ever enjoy salvation future who have no interest in salvation past, in other words, as no one will ever be with Christ in eternal glory, whose names were not written in the book of life from all eternity. So also none will enjoy salvation future, who live and die without enjoying salvation present. In other words, none will live forever with Christ in glory, who are not betrothed to him in this life. By the, manifest, by the manifestations of him into their soul and who have not partaken of all three movements in the great work of Almighty God. All doctrines, notions, forms, creeds, ordinances and ceremonies short of experiential, knowledgeable salvation are as the dust in the balance, and as the stubble driven before the wind. What, for instance, I might ask you is election, except it be revealed to my soul that I was elected before the foundation of the world? What is redemption to me, except that the atoning blood of the Lamb be sprinkled on my conscience? What is the everlasting love of God, unless that eternal love be shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit. What is the final perseverance of the saints, unless there is an enjoyment of it in the conscience as a personal reality as we live now? To see these things revealed in the Bible is not enough. To hear them preached is not enough. To receive the truth of these things merely into our mind and our judgments is not enough. Thousands, millions have done all this who are yet consigned to eternal darkness. Oh, my friends, but to have eternal election, personal redemption, imputed righteousness, unfailing love and all the other fruit of our heavenly relationship flow freely and abundantly into the soul from the throne of God to have the beauty, glory of salvation revealed to the heart and sealed upon the conscience this my friends this is all in all a man's soul it must be damned or saved. And a man, a man must have salvation as an internal, living, beating reality within him. As a known, enjoyed, tasted, felt, and handled possession. Or he will never enter the kingdom of heaven. He may be churchman or dissenter, anything or everything. And yet all his profession is no more towards his salvation than the cut of his clothes or the color of his eyes 
unless he knows our Lord consciously and intimately within his soul. And thus, all a man's consistency of life, his soundness of creed, his walking in the ordinances, his long and steady profession, and all their works of a merely external nature on which thousands are resting for their salvation, can no more put away sin, satisfy the justice of God, or give your soul a title for heaven than a telephone conversation with your mother. For the truth is, my friends, that from the very nature of the fall, it is impossible for a dead soul to believe in God, know God, or love God. They are crippled, paralytic, bedridden, unable to lift up either a leg or a finger. Man is dead in sin. His faculties are all crippled. He is utterly helpless in the things of God. He must be quickened by the Spirit of God into life anew, a spiritual life, before he can ever come to savingly know the risen Lamb of Almighty God. And thus there it is, my friends, at the very threshold, in the very heart and core of the case, the absolute necessity of the regenerating operations of the Holy Spirit upon the soul. As it says repeatedly in his word, none can come unless they be drawn, and none will come whose names have not been written in the book of life from before the beginning. On our own, my friends, we can do nothing save spin our wheels. Now we may, by observing the workings of the natural mind, come to some conclusions that we are all, we and all men are naturally selfish, proud, obstinate and worldly. But this knowledge does not produce any sense of godly sorrow or any contrition on account of indwelling sin. We do not yet have any humility except as the Lord is pleased to teach the soul to be humble. And how how, you ask, does he produce this genuine humility of the soul? By showing us what we are, my friends. Opening up the secrets we conceal in the heart. Discovering the desperate wickedness of our fallen nature and convincing us that sin is intermingled with every thought, word, look, and action. But when the Spirit takes us in hand, strips away the veil of delusion from our eyes. Then, then we begin to see and feel the blackness within us, the blackness of our heart, that we are sinners indeed, inwardly as well as outwardly. Because, my friends, we see ourselves for the very first time through the eyes of God's purity and holiness. And here, my friends, here, when we see this, we move into that second movement of God's handiwork for the first time. Now do we begin to hear the intricate harmonies of heaven? Now, for the first time, do we glimpse the light of our risen Lord and a view of Christ's glory, my friends, and a foretaste of the bliss and blessedness it communicates into our soul has a transforming effect upon the life and the very being of a man. When enabled by the Spirit's operations to see Him, to know Him, and to receive Him into our lives and heart, we are then taught to feel our need of continual supplies of grace and strength out of His fullness. For we have much to learn, much to learn of the depths of the fall, of the evils of our own heart, of the temptations and warfare with Satan, of the strength of sin, and of our own weakness. 
and as every fresh discovery of our helplessness makes makes itself a way for looking to clinging to and hanging upon him him we become more and more dependent upon him as our wisdom our righteousness our sanctification our redemption our very life itself and in this walk with him in this walk with him we are renewed and transformed and made ready made ready my friends for our entrance into the third movement of his grand story his eternal symphony of salvation the movement of eternity so you see three movements chosen chosen for redemption before the foundation of the world washed in the blood and purified in this cauldron of physical reality and finally transformed at the marriage supper of the Lamb into beings of light meant to inhabit eternity with our Heavenly Father well there you have it my friends the grand symphony of God's grace pure pure and intricate in its love and yet simple and elegant in its design and its workings. A symmetry so sublime that it in itself is a witness to the love and the majesty of Almighty God. Amen. Praise Almighty God. Until the next time, my friends. Have a wonderful day in our risen Lord. Goodbye.